Our focus as we begin today is to look at the ways conference leaders are involved in the work of the Board of Ordained Ministry. The responsibilities of each of those leaders and how and why they should work together. We have invited a panel that includes bishop, conference staff who provide ministerial services, former district superintendents, some of whom served on the board before they became DS, served on the board in the capacity of being the cabinet rep, and some who are now back on the board, having no longer being a district superintendent, and they are serving in various capacities as present board members. What we'd like to address are the questions of who has what responsibilities? What are the different roles? What information needs to be communicated amongst conference leaders to ensure that the work of the Board of Ordained Ministry runs smoothly? And what are the appropriate boundaries among the leadership positions that ensure a fair process for all the candidates and the clergy? Those are some of the beginning questions that I have um, asked them to think about, but they are willing to address questions that you might bring also. So I'd like you to welcome, first of all, Bishop Mike McKee from the North Texas Conference, Reverend Don Neal, who is from North Alabama, Reverend J.F. LeCarrier from West Virginia, Reverend Bill Brownson from North Alabama, Reverend Sonia Waldman Bond from the Yellowstone Conference, and Reverend Chuck Lewis from Iowa. And I'm going to begin at this end. I'm going to ask Bishop Mike McKee, who four years ago was sitting where you're sitting when he came to the Board of Ordained Ministry for training as a chair of a Board of Ordained Ministry. And here he is four years later as Bishop Mike McKee of the North Texas Conference. I have asked him, first of all, to look at the four years he spent as a Board of Ordained Ministry chair and to reflect on some of the experiences he had with his bishop in those four years, and then to look ahead to say, how has what you learned as a Board of Ordained Ministry Chair informed the way you believe you will be a bishop with that information? So uh, thank you, Bishop McKee. Well, uh, welcome again. So it's good to be with you uh, this morning. Uh, last spring, uh, as I began to visit with the Division of Ordained Ministry staff, uh, one of the things I volunteered to do because I knew I was going to chair the Board of Ordained Ministry in Central Texas again, this quadrennium, is I said I'd be glad to help with the training. And I had, had no idea that this is the way I'd be helping with the training. <laughs> But I did learn some things, and so I want to I sort of talk about that uh, briefly, and then as we move through our time together, perhaps there'll be some ways for, us, for me to talk about it more particularly. Uh, I, one of the things that, that I did learn is, is that, and, and knew this, but learned it in some very significant ways, is that we have different responsibilities. And I think it's important that we all acknowledge that. And the most challenging thing, I think, for a person on the Board of Ordained Ministry, a chairperson or other leaders on the Board of Ordained Ministry, is how you say that to an Episcopal leader. Now, I, I know that. And uh, you may think that that's difficult, but one of my goals as the chair of the Board of Ordained Ministry was to stay out of the Judicial Council for four years. Amen. And I was successful. <laughs> so, so that being said, let me say, is that it is the responsibility of the board uh, to qualify persons for ordained ministry. And while the bishop and especially the superintendents have a role in that process, it is in terms of the evaluation. And we'll talk later about some other things. It's, it's important that we understand the difference. 
Now, one of the things I've become keenly aware of, I knew this before, become keenly aware of, is that one of the things that I need to do is to be clear about what, what kind of persons we need to do ministry in the North Texas Conference uh, over the next 20 to 30 years. And knowing who is doing ministry in the North Texas Conference presently in terms of age and skill sets uh, then helps us under, get clear about what that, what that means. So, so, I, so I know that's something I can do. And, you know, just as an aside, I'm, I'm going to do that, and we had a, a brief conversation about this. I'm going to do that without using the word entrepreneur. Not that it's a bad word, but we've got to find a way to talk about our witness, I think, in very crystal clear, theological, faithful terms. So I see that as a role that I need to bring to the process. Uh, likewise, a difference is when, when... Am I talking too long here? Okay, so, so the other thing is, is, that, um, uh, is that I'm clear that if, 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 I'm, if, if I or the cabinet are sending uh, a name uh, for administrative complaint, uh, I think it's my role and the cabinet's role to be clear about documentation and to be very transparent about what's happening. That there's a fairness about this that that really then begins to strike at the integrity of the church. And so I think it's very important that I be very transparent about what any issues there may be. And I'll talk more about that. So I'm clear that it's my, uh, that my responsibility and the cabinet's responsibility to appoint people and then to evaluate, to evaluate persons. I'm talking about people in full connection so that later if we have an issue in terms of something that needs to be taken care of remedially or administratively or... Um, uh, in any other way, uh, that we'll do that with, with sense of fairness, and and we will we will document document document, in order to to be uh, fair uh, to the church, and to and to the person. Uh, so ch chairing the board of our ministry really opened my eyes in a lot of ways about, in which and I knew this, the sacred work as I said yesterday that we are called to do, which means that we are clear, as a board of our ministry about what the mission of the church is and who are the people that we need to enlist and, um, and, and then get ready for ministry. And then as, as a bishop, then about how we continue the evaluation not only of clergy, but also laity and churches about how they're fulfilling their mission. Thank you. We, we will come back to some more questions, but I'm going to ask some of the others to do some reflecting at this point, if that's okay. Um, we, have, we have two persons, Don and um, Jeff, who are staff to the Boards of Ordained Ministry. Now, what does that mean in terms of your role and the distinction of what you do um, with your boards? <laughs> okay, Jay. I think I think it's important in my uh, my own setting to understand uh, why I would describe my position as both on the edge and in the middle. Uh, I brought into the position uh, years of experience. Well, let me begin by saying I'm an ordained deacon. Uh, in the United Methodist Church. And uh, so I had experience serving as chair and registrar for the Board of Diaconal Ministry. Uh, in 96, that turned over to participation in the Board of Ordained Ministry and service in the Board of Directors of GBHEM. And from that base, we made our appeal within our conference for a staff person. Um, my work with the board is as an advisor. I am not a member of the board. I'm not an ex officio member of the board. I am present when the board meets. I'm not involved in interviews or decision making, but I do have an advisory function. And because of my work on staff too, that uh, creates a bridge to the work of the cabinet and uh, conversation with the bishop too about the work of the board, the direction of the board, 
and then sometimes specific advisory capacity around certain issues that we'd face. Um, I think one of the distinctive things that it's made possible in our conference is uh, presence that's characterized by networking and relationship. Because I am uh, appointed as staff person to the board, then I bring into the conversation this tremendous network of board staff members that are scattered across the uh, connection. And um, I have them to serve as advisors to me, plus we can bring to the table best practices uh, learned by all the people who are re relating in their conferences as staff members to their particular board. And the job descriptions are extremely varied, so collectively uh, we're much more than we are individually. Um, and then also uh, it helps in establishing a strong relationship with the general board and, and a, a good conduit of information uh, that functions on both sides of that equation, people who are making appointive decisions, uh, cabinets, bishops, and people who are making status decisions, uh, boards of ordained ministry, district committees. I serve basically, as far as the staff person related to ordained ministry, as somewhat of a coordinator. Uh, I do have another responsibility as well. We have a board of superannuated homes, which is 128 homes for retired clergy, and I'm primarily responsible for that. But for ordained ministry, uh, within the board, uh, we have a, a staff person, an uh, administrative assistant who's here, and she does a lot of the day-to-day -day record keeping and that kind of thing, but uh, the decision making as far as what issues go to what committees within the board, that's a lot of stuff that I handle. Uh, in our annual conference, for good or bad, I've gotten the reputation of I'm the one who knows what the discipline says. Uh, I'm not even going to comment on that one. <laughs> uh, I've been in the job now for about seven years, and prior to that I was on the cabinet for six. I guess I have about 25 years in one relationship with the board or another over a lifetime of ministry. So I know a little bit about local pastors. I know a little bit about most of the sections of the board. And uh, it makes it a little easier for me then to become a, a consultant uh, to the cabinet at times about not only the provisions of the discipline for ordained ministry, but some of the history of what might have taken place 10, 15 years ago with regard to individuals or why certain decisions were made by the board even back that long ago. And so I'm the, uh, in some parts, I'm also an institutional memory uh, for, the, uh, for the Board of Ordained Ministry. Uh, we do have a, a good working relationship with the cabinet. We have had a good relationship, the board has, throughout the years. Bishop, I'm sorry, I, I didn't manage to stay out of the Judicial Council. In fact, we've got two before the Judicial Council right now from North Alabama. One of them related in a way to ordained ministry. So we're looking at have, seeing what the Judicial Council says to us this time. But basically, I would say I'm a, I'm a coordinator of moving things within the board and then moving things back and forth between the bishop, cabinet, and the Board of Ordained Ministry. Thanks. Um, I'm going to ask Bill now. Bill, my understanding is that you served as a district superintendent. I, were you, you served on the board before you became a... Okay, you got a mic for me. I was a board chair, <laughs> <laughs> went in the cabinet, and came back onto the board. Okay. So you've had a variety of experiences. Can you reflect on the differences that you had as a cab cabinet representative on there. Um, as a chair, were there some distinctive lines between 
um, what you knew and what the cabinet knew and how did you communicate those and were there some boundaries there that had to be kept? And then my understanding is you're now on there as conference relations committee. And I'd like to know how what you knew as a chair and as a DS um, helps or hinders you in your new role, okay? Well, as board chair and then in the cabinet and probably now as conference relations chair, I just do what Don tells me. And um, <laughs> uh, no, the, there, there, there are distinct roles and as the board chair, it was, uh, you, you are overseeing the whole process. And you have to begin that process with the first, when the candidate first walks through the door of a district superintendent, the board is involved through the, through the DCOM. And so while I was chair, we began that process of strengthening the DCOM and putting into place a, a much stronger process there. Guidelines for every interview, um, a, a, a true time of discernment was put into place where we were able to coordinate that work, make it as easy as possible for someone to navigate a system that sometimes is very overwhelming and very cumbersome, at least to a new person walking into it. And so we put in, the, in, in all the checkpoints along the way with our district candidacy coordinators. And then to understand that how that process feeds through, through provisional membership, through ordination, and through those moments when you have to say no. And as a board chair, working with the cabinet, because the cabinet has been, they've been a part of those people's lives for many years before they ever hit the board. And trying to help them to be the pastor to the pastors, giving them enough information that they can do that for a person that we're having to say no to for whatever reason we're saying no. And, but at the same time, hold in confidence what we know as a, as a board. And the key for me always was the cabinet needs to know information related to appointability because the cabinet has that role of appointing people. They do not have the power of credentialing. And, and so keeping those kind of issues in mind of what is really appointive related and what is credential related because they're, they're, those are two distinct items. And so it was always, as a board chair, what do we tell the cabinet? And, and sometimes that is a long discussion that Don and I would have is, as the board chair and the staff person having that conversation around which, what, what of these things that this person ha is, we, we've sort of uncovered in our process with this person, our journey with this person, does the cabinet need to be made aware of as they are making the appointment? And what do we need to hold because it only relates to their credentialing process. And, and so we would have those kind of conversations along the way. As the cabinet rep, I'll be honest, the hardest part is a cabinet rep sitting back on the board after being board chair and having been the, the vice chair, I mean, I mean the secretary before that and, and serving in various roles on the board before that is the cabinet rep, then all you get is just the point of stuff. Um, you want to know all the other stuff, too, about these people because you've grown to be, uh, you're a part of their lives and you're a part of their journey as you've been on the board. And now as a cabinet rep, you are sitting there hearing from the board rather than participating fully in the board. And there's a bit of frustration that, that comes for the cabinet rep in that time. And I found that I would ask far too many questions and be told, you not really are supposed to know that now uh, here in the cabinet and I would have to just walk away and be mad um, <laughs> because our, our current chair who's out here and our, our staff person wouldn't tell me certain things um, and now back going back into the board as the conference relations chair in our training the other day looking at the fair process system uh, John Simmons just kept saying over and over again I've known John for several years now and I know that he's not an extremist, and so it really unnerved me when he kept saying over and over again, this is not for the faint of heart. Um, you're going to need very thick skin. You, know, you need to read these books. You, know, you need to get a spiritual guide. Uh, I, was really, I was afraid we were about to go into drink. Uh, I didn't know where we were. <laughs> John was not really lifting my spirits, but I know what he was saying. Because the conference relations 
chair, whoever you are out there, if you've never served in the cabinet, then, and if you've never served in really at the, in the executive committee of your board before, you're about to be made privy to information that you'll never forget. And you're about to see lives in situations and in circumstances that you're not going to be able to wipe out of your mind because it's, you know, when I, years ago a district superintendent friend in another conference said as he was preparing to leave the cabinet to go back into the local church, he said, I, I'm just so afraid that I can't unlearn all the things that I've learned about the people that I'll be sitting with in the district. Well, you, it's the same way on the board. And it'll be the same way for whoever serves as a conference relations chair. You're going to be a part of a process and you're going to be, that, that's truly a sacred process of our church that holds our, our faithful witness in the community at its highest importance. But it's going to be difficult. And I think having the experience in the cabinet where you've had to stand with congregations and stand with pastors and their families and extended families and you have been there as, as these kind of conversations are starting and you've felt the pain and you've seen the hurt and I guess in a weird way that does prepare you to be a conference relations chair because as John said it, it's not for the faint of heart. I'm going to ask you to pass that to um, Sonia. Um, Sonia, it's, having had some conversation with you, you um, bring a very different experience to this. You were called to become a DS in a conference you had not served in, um, formerly being a missionary in Germany. So you came into that conference where I believe you were the first woman DS and you were part of the board. You didn't know the people, but you were there to help in a cultural shift within that conference. Would you like to reflect on some of your learnings in that experience um, and how your relationship to the board and being a DS um, helped or hindered in that process? Thank you. <laughs> I, told, I told them I was scared, so they had to be out there and be nice to me. <laughs> Um, yes, I was uh, serving as a missionary in Germany. Well, and I think part of the experience that I brought um, is that I've been a part of four annual conferences. I don't know how many people there are that have been uh, had that experience. Um, and the first conference was uh, a lesson on how not to do things, um, a very painful process. The second conference was uh, on ways from people that owed you nothing how to be a good board of ordained ministry and working um, as cabinet in that place. And then to be in Germany and be part of a German central conference and to have arrived in that country just a month or two before the Berlin Wall came down and all of the changes going on with all of that and getting to know a German bishop and uh, helping him with dress codes in the US and some other odd sorts of things and a very brilliant man. And then getting a call at 11 o'clock one night um, in November at the end of our very first English language um, walk to Emmaus from Bishop Marianne Swenson that I had met once saying, would you come to Yellowstone Annual Conference uh, as a superintendent? And when I arrived then, uh, of course, Bishop Mary Ann was just moved, and uh, she moved to California. So uh, then I uh, came in, and Bishop Brown came in, so I had the first black bishop and the first female DS as a team, and his response to that is, well, you have to be dean of the cabinet. <laughs> so, uh, so then I came into the Board of Ordained Ministry, <laughs> and um, actually have felt quite a welcome there. But what I realized that I could bring was the experience of three other annual conferences, thank you, and, um, and also the newness, a, a different perspective. And in a sense, I think that was Bishop Swenson's intent, was to put me there as the reagent. Uh, John Daniels and I looked up this chemical term, which is uh, reagent is that which you drop 
uh, an amount you drop into a already mix, okay, a, a liquid mix that you want to change the nature of and you keep putting little drops in it until it changes the whole. And so I was kind of that first drop, I think, uh, to be into place. And I found that um, it's a small annual conference and I found it a real gift that I could walk into the Board of Ordained Ministry and listen to uh, people, seeing them coming before the board. And because it's a small conference, we have one, two, I think the most candidates uh, at a time since I've been there is four. And currently, and we did have um, this last meeting, we had no candidates at this one. So one, two, three people at a time. So we do get to know them, which is a real gift. But coming from the outside into a small conference, I had no history. So I could see people as they are when we first see them at the board. I didn't know all the things in their history. I didn't know the complications in their lives. And I think that helped me to make um, contributions from that perspective that were different from what the, the rest of the people on the board could do. Um, and I hope that that also helped us encourage some folks that, um, you know, we're all in process. Isn't that what it is to be Wesleyan or be, being made new? So they could see, I could help them see the person that they now were without being cluttered with the persons that they had been. I could also then bring the experience of what it is like to be rejected and to have a board that literally mishandled things amazingly so that the meeting ended with no ending, just people wandering out the door saying, what the heck happened? Because we went through the process, I was approved, the superintendent came in and said, she's off and um, sent me out. Um, so I think that background um, and what I would want from that experience to say to people is to help you on the boards, even if you've been part of the conference forever, to try to see these people with a present tense eyes and to listen to them with present tense ears, to see where they are now more than, more than where they were, watch and celebrate the changes and the growth, and then help them to be strengthened to become the pastors that you know that they can be. Um, we have a wonderful opportunity on a board of ordained ministry to be encouraging and teaching pastors uh, and loving and caring and also to learn how to speak the truth in love and to say the hard things that will help people to change and to grow uh, into the people God wants of them. Thank you. Chuck from Iowa, you served on the cabinet and now you are on the board as once again a conference relation is this the sort of theme that former ds's become conference relations chairs i don't know but would you reflect on your experience on the board and now what you bring how that's informed you in this new role um you were on the board as a ds correct uh, I was not the oh okay person, no okay Reflect on okay. DS and conference relations for us. Thanks. When I was asked to be on the cabinet, I was in the local church, and I was asked to be on the cabinet. And I served seven years as a district superintendent of the Creston District in the southern part of Iowa. And then, after serving the seven years on the cabinet, I was asked to come on to the onto the board of ordained ministry. And I was on the board for I think a couple of years, or one year at least. And then I was asked to become a part of the conference relations committee, and then chair of that committee. I serve as a co-chair of the committee. Um, I kind of joke, uh, my co-chairs, I've gone through three of them in my tenure. Um, two of them were appointed district superintendents and one went off the board and I have a brand new one this year uh, coming on board as well, which be, I'm looking forward to work with. Uh, one of the reflections I think that I have uh, serving the seven years on the cabinet and then coming back to the local, uh, working on the board is, it's serving on the cabinet, it's so important, I think, uh, for the DCOMs. From that very start of a person inquiring about ministry and having that nurture and having that guidance through the system and, and to be done properly, I think those of you who have served as district superintendents know if that is not done properly, uh, through the years, the conference relations people 
receive them on the other end because something maybe maybe have been amiss along the way and uh, a, a pastor for whatever reason crashes and burns in a local church and uh, so it's so important I think on that beginning of that process to to be able to nurture to be able to help them discern him or her discern their their call uh, of ministry uh, the direction that they want to go in the local church and what their gifts and graces are I think um, I've served on the DCOM as well, and sometimes I, I've often joked with people, we want to be graceful, but we don't want to practice cheap grace. In other words, to be graceful in love, and sometimes you have to call a spade a spade, if you will, with people and in love, and helping them to discern their call. Their call to ministry may be a call to ministry, but not necessarily to United Methodist ordained ministry. And there is a big difference. And uh, whether or not they have a fire, what I call a fire in the belly, to reach people for Jesus Christ. Um, so I see that on that end. And I, so I guess the important part is for, for the DCOMs and, and for the examination teams and you know, through the whole process, that is so important to, to be um, very intentional in that examination, very intentional in those questions to help people to to see for themselves where God is leading them in the whole process. Okay, on, on your reflections, you've given us a glimpse of all the experiences that you've had and that many of you have had different roles at different times. Um, we here, now I'm, I'm speaking from my colleagues here, we here at the General Board of Higher Education and Ministry from time to time there are some boards that have some differences with their cabinet and bishop, and that that has hindered the work in some way. Um, I wonder if any of you would be willing to speak to that in the sense of the kind of issues that can come up that cause that disconnect or um, issues that have to be dealt with between board, cabinet, and bishop. Somebody willing? <laughs> now, I was a Board of Ordained Ministry Chair for four years and two months. I've been a bishop for two months. <laughs> However, so I, so I really understand the Board of Ordained Ministry Chair role better. I mean, let's acknowledge that. But there's some things I learned that I'm not going to do. And there's some things I learned that I'm going to do. So I, I think that might be helpful. One is, is I am... And this is not evaluative of my experiences. It's my colleagues telling me they wish I wouldn't speak about this. <laughs> but I'm serious about this because I'm so clear about the delineation of responsibilities. So I hope that I can hear a decision from a board of ordained ministry with which I may not agree and move on. Okay? Because I need to respect, you know, uh, the body who's responsible for that. Uh, the deal is, as I make appointments, I too hope that a conference can respect the appointments made and move on. I, I just want a, a mutuality of respect about the different roles. Is that helpful for everyone to hear? So these are some things I learned. What I learned is because I had frustration at one point about the work of the district committees and we all know that one of the key entry points in the process is a district superintendent. That one of the most frustrating things for me as a board chair were district committees or district superintendents who, who decided they wanted to do it their way. But they work for you. The district committees work for the board. And so that means I'm having this gradual, clear conversation with the superintendents in the North Texas Conference when it comes to the candidacy issues, and this is difficult, I think going to be difficult for them to hear, you work for the Board of Ordained Ministry. And the reason is, is because the entry point into the process, for me, gets to be the most critical time in the whole deal. Do they get a call back? Are they assigned a mentor? Are they assigned the appropriate mentor? Do they have a mentor who's going to be able to help them discern whether they are called to ministry of the laity or are they, are they really uh, have, are fit for ordained ministry? 
And so we've had this beginning conversation in which I just have pulled one bishop card already, and it's only one. You will do it the way the Board of Art and Ministry has asked for it to be done. So I'm, I'm very clear about that. And the reason I'm clear about it is because I'm so, so, such a firm believer that this fitness issue for persons for ministry is what's killing us. And it's why later on in the process somebody says, I mean, I had a conversation with some, some people earlier today at breakfast time. They get through the process, it's like, we've got to say yes because of all the time they put in, and the last thing we want to do is say yes. So, so I'm really, I'm re at the beginning, it's like I'm, I'm just helping us all work through that. And I, I, I think that's something I've learned. There's another piece I've learned. And, and I think this is a shocker. Uh, it, was, it, it, it surprised me and our cabinet. And that is the role of that superintendent on that board of ordained ministry. And when we got ready to discontinue someone, and then that person appealed, all of a sudden I began to read through the appeals process, and I realized we've been in violation forever of the Judicial Council Decision 917. 917, write it down. And so a cabinet rep cannot participate in the conversation or the deliberations about pieces related to administrative and to discontinuing a membership. But I want to tell you, I think that happens all over this, the country, that, that, the, that the superintendent's in the room. So as the board chair, what I said was, is I think it's appropriate the superintendent not be in the room at all related to any interview, any decision making about orders. And there was a great pushback about it, but we never know if we're going to be talking about someone and we realize we're going to discontinue her or him. So because the, because the culture of the conference is such, and I think in some of them it's like, well, how do we learn about somebody if the superintendent in the room? Well, you know, that's why we have evaluations that are written. And so one of the things I think is important is for us to be clear about the evaluation process related that the, that the that DS has a role in in terms of the board, in terms of what's going on in the appointment. And the evaluation then is, is the conclusion follows what, what's written. And the most fr frustrating thing is to read, this person does this well, this well, this well, but I would not ordain this person. Well, it doesn't lead to therefore. So I think one of the things that, that I'm going to be clear about as a bishop, because I was clear about as a board of ministry, is, is the proper role of the superintendent, uh, of, of that superintendent in that, in, in that process, and I think it's important. And how important it is to realize there are times that the, that the cabinet, including myself, work for the board, or at least in partnership with the board, about how we're qualifying and getting people ready for ministry. 917. <laughs> It changed my life. <laughs> Let's see if you stay away from judicial counsel another four years. <laughs> That's not an appropriate thing to say to me. <laughs> I, I really think that the times when we've had difficulty between the board and, and the cabinet, and they have been few in North Alabama, thank goodness. The whole issue was communication. Uh, the cabinet would be doing some of the things that the bishops talked about, and they're dealing with the evaluation of that person's performance, or they would be dealing with recruiting people for particular positions, uh, appointed positions, and somehow or another they would forget that the credentialing side of things had to be taken care of as well. Um, and we're called in at the last minute and asked to rubber stamp something. And, and, and our board, uh, well, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm old and I, and, I'm, and I can get mean sometime. Uh, and I can say no very, very quickly. Uh, but hear me, we, we've had pretty good relationship with that. The other thing that, that sometime, from my perspective, if the cabinet had just simply, or the cabinet rep had called and said, you know, we're really working with something and we, we need some help on being sure we're in sync with the board on this particular issue, 
we could both solve some and save some time and energy. And I, I hope we're doing better with that right now. I, I would echo, out of my experience, the same things Don said. When decisions are made that need to be expedient and fast, we often get out of rhythm. Uh, in the cases of transfers, in the cases of preparing people for licensing school, getting them ready for appointment. I'd add to that cases where uh, individuals over-function. Uh, I think the difficult position that walks alongside a candidate is the district superintendent who begins very immersed in that call and helping interpret it. And as they move closer and closer to ordination, their, um, uh, their role shifts tremendously and they can easily overfunction. Um, we say often, uh, the we being our director of connectional ministry, our director of administrative services and me, why did they not call? People that are making decisions, interpreting parts of the discipline and they choose to make that decision in isolation and don't call. Uh, the discipline needs interpretation and the conference needs to be aligned around that interpretation. And if they don't talk to each other, uh, there'll be a lot of good interpretation, but it may not be in alignment and can get into real uh, difficult situations. I also, think that, I also think that the frustration comes when the board receives something from the cabinet, and this has happened only on a couple of occasions that I can think of in our conference, but we, the board receives something from a cabinet member that's not just telling the board what the issue is, but is also telling the board what they want the result to be. And as the bishop said, sometimes the board, when it goes through the full process, doesn't hand back to the cabinet what they particularly had hoped to receive back. And it, it, you know, the district superintendents sometimes are looking at a situation based off of their knowledge of the situation or based off of what they, their frustration is with the, with the pastor or with the situation, the circumstance. And so they come to the board with their, their this, is, this is the issue, and this is how we'd like it resolved, and can you figure out how to navigate that? And um, that's when, as board chair, I was able just to say, you know, Don, tell them no. And, <laughs> and, and Don would tell them no. And, uh, but no, it was <laughs> sometimes. Uh, but it is, it is, it, that is, that, that's where part of the frustration does come in because, they're dealing with a point of issue, and we're dealing with credentialing issue, and sometimes the process that we have to follow in order to stay in line with the discipline, in order to stay in line with all of the judicial council rulings that have come down through the years, will not get them the result that they have determined that they need. There are other avenues that they can pursue to get their ended, the, the needed result and they have to go down those avenues that we can't get them there through another process. And sometimes that's frustrating to, to try to explain to someone that just wants it done and done today. I'm not, not deliberately changing the subject, but kind of taking a little twist. In, um, in my 12 years now at Yellowstone Conference, I haven't bumped into real conflicts between the roles um, and responsibilities between cabinet and board of ordained ministry. It seems like uh, we have worked well with that, been able to keep the lines separated as much as you can in a small conference. The issue that our board deals with um, frequently is with the local congregation because most of our people that we deal with are already serving in a church. Just once in a while have we had any that are still in school. And it's that congregation who loves their pastor and wants them to either get whatever, it, whatever they're up for, whether if it's they're up for their um, probationary status or up for elders, you know, this is their beloved. And um, it's, so we've spent time working out how to accompany the candidate back to their congregation and discuss with that um, staff pastor parish relations committee with um, 
why we are extending them why we're not giving them the the ok that they want at the time that that's been more the conflict in our small space and i think we've done that really well and so it's something i would pass on as a possibility when you can do that is to take two or three people from the board to accompany that candidate to go back and meet with the the ppr committee and explain to them why they're being continued um, and what's to be expected and ask for their help in that process. Well, on the same kind of vein, what, um, every year the board meets with the full cabinet and bishop. Is there some suggestions that you might give to other board members of what are the kind of issues that you can deal with in that meeting or you have dealt with in that meeting that were particularly helpful both to the board, cabinet, and bishop at that time? Um, I'll just make it real quick. We, we don't, as a whole cabinet meet, have a deliberate meeting with the, the whole of the board. That's not been part of our practice. A, a, a DS is generally on the board or a company, you know, not necessarily a member, but they're at most of our meetings, but we haven't had a specific annual meeting. How about some of the others of you have, what's your practice? Uh, we, our executive committee meets with the full cabinet okay. each year. Um, I think it provides us an opportunity in addition to address some very uh, time near issues. Uh, for instance, a great deal of time is being spent right now in uh, sharing the new design of candidacy in reflection to the new uh, legislation around vocational discernment coordinator and the opportunity of group mentoring. But it also gives us an opportunity to step back and look at some longer range issues uh, where we can talk about our relationship with uh, seminaries in higher education. We can talk about uh, the rhythm of a board over quadrenniums, not just year to year within a quadrennium. Um, and that's the place that's rich, uh, a rich opportunity for conversation. We do not spend any time that I recall over the last eight, eight years uh, talking with each other about specific issues and individuals that are, we're facing currently. Our board for the last eight years has been rather limited in its uh, meetings with full, with full cabinet. Uh, the only thing we really have done uh, recently, for the most part, is to go over the reports just prior to annual conference. A lot of that, quite frankly, was because the bishop and the cabinet did not make themselves available to us in the time that we needed to be present with them and to talk through some of the issues. Uh, I believe that probably in our case is changing this time because we've had a change in in leadership in the cabinet and had a change in bishops in different style. Uh, I hope that one of the things that will come out of that will be a time when we can sit down and, and it, even during the year, not just as we're getting ready for annual conference, to begin to look at some of the significant things that have to happen within the, the rhythm of the uh, Board of Ordained Ministry for the quadrennium and for the annual conference year. We meet together as an executive committee of the Board of Ordained Ministry with the Cabinet at least twice a year, and some of the issues are just kind of a listing of what's been going on in the annual conference, you know, amongst our pastors and and working with of our um, you know Board of Elders, local pastors, and so on and so forth, and to see what kind of continuing education opportunities or group meetings that we can have as an annual conference or pastors uh, together to to uh, to address some of those issues in the conference. Um, I do want to give some time for you to ask uh, questions. There are two microphone stands, as you can see. Um, if you would have questions for that could be addressed to a specific person um, on our panel, or if you would like to ask the question and make it open, let us know that too. So someone at the back there, or the hand up. I have a question for the bishop. 
Uh, you mentioned at the beginning of your remarks that one of the things you needed to do was reflect on the kind of leadership that is needed to take our church into the future. And given that we have experienced 40 years of pretty steady decline, and given the fact that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result, I wonder if you could reflect on your thoughts of what we need to be looking for or and or the process that you might go through as a new bishop to determine exactly what it is we should be looking for because I think having that vision for the Board of Ordained Ministry is absolutely critical for our work for the future. That is a very good question, which is a way for me to say I need to think about this a little bit as I frame this. Here's, here, this, is the, this is the way in which I am beginning to move through that, and it is in this way. Uh, I don't know, this is what I know how to do well. I know how to be the pastor of a local church. I know how to do that very well. And, what, and I know they're not the same jobs, but I know there's some, some pieces that may be consistent, and that is is that you, you begin to learn the community, and you begin to learn, uh, you begin to know people. And while uh, this is a much larger system, then, I, then I've had to begin to uh, determine how it is that I begin to learn the communities in North Texas. I'm going to make this very particular, because then it becomes, it's easier for me, I think, to talk about it universally. So, so knowing the communities of North Texas, uh, I, I'm from Fort Worth, from Central Texas, and it's just it's adjacent to North Texas. We shared a bishop at one time. I, I said when I was assigned to North Texas that I know that conference better than any other conference other than the one that I came from. And then, lo and behold, September 1 comes, or actually September 4th was the first day in the office because it was Labor Day weekend, and I realized that what I knew about North Texas was Dallas County and Collin County. And, you know, it was just typical. You know, I, I know lots of people. So I realized there are a whole swath of the, of the conference that I didn't know. But I learned something else pretty quickly. Uh, I learned that the demographics of North Texas are, are somewhat like uh, uh, the country. You have this very large urban center. Uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth area, for example, is the fourth or the fifth largest media market in the country. So you have this sense of this urban population that's very, very diverse. And then you have this, these suburban counties to the north uh, that have very large churches. And, there's a, and, there's, and, there, and there are some large churches in Dallas County, large churches in Collin and Denton County. And so you have a sense of the suburbs. And then you begin to move farther north. And, you know, in urban and suburban counties, they have a wide diversity of churches and populations. And then you begin to move north. And then you realize there are, there are towns, there are county seats, there are rural communities. And all of a sudden I realize this becomes then a lab. Perhaps if I could see North Texas as a lab uh, for, the, for the church, as a whole. Not to say that we would do it better than anybody else, but that, that we would see that the demographics that we have uh, may look somewhat like the country. Uh, because if you want to know what the demographics of the United States are going to be, our demographers in the state of Texas say, look at the state of Texas. That we're about 20 or 30 years ahead of the rest of the country in terms of the demographics, in terms of mix. So I began to think about that. So how do I know that? And what I know is, is there's no one pastor who, can, who could serve each of those communities. Does that make sense? So I know that as I talk to someone, I realize, you know, and, and it's not that I'm doing an evaluation every time I'm having a conversation with a pastor, so I don't want anybody here thinking, you know, I'm putting everything there. But as I'm talking to someone, I realize this person has unique gifts to do an urban setting in a, in a neighborhood that may be either gentrifying or that is declining. I mean, I, I'm not sure. And, and how is it that they can then uh, uh, lead a church through a transition time? I know that there are people who do that well. And then there are persons who I know that they've got a great pastor's heart and would do very well in, in a small town setting and would have a bang up ministry. I mean, you know, you sort of, so I realize I have, I have to be, we all have to begin to look for a variety of people. And, and the way we've talked about it, I think we think, I'm wondering if we've uh, probably have done ourselves a disservice, and we've got to think through this clearly, is that, um, you know, we, we, we've used words to talk about the leaders we need. But, um, 
one of the most interesting places in North Texas is served by a part-time local pastor who actually has very good theology, his superintendent reports to me, who is a ranch foreman and pastors a church with 180 to 200 persons on Sunday morning. Now, I don't know that he can serve other... I mean, there are settings that he's going to do very well in. And then I have people who graduate from Perkins who would literally take that church into the ground quickly. And not, wait a minute, and let me be clear because I'm a proponent of theological education. You may hear this wrong. That's just not who they are or what they can do. So I believe we have to look for uh, people who can, uh, who, uh, it's not one size fits all. So we have to have a, uh, what I would call a, a, a group of elders and deacons who are varied and realize that, you know, they, they have particular gifts and graces for particular places. And, um, and so, so I think that's important. So that's, uh, is, is that helpful? Someone was the ask, asking a question. So I think that's an ongoing process by, by the cabinet telling, telling uh, the board, hey, we need people who can do county seats and do it well. And we need people who can do urban areas. We need people who can do larger churches. We need people who can do suburbs. And so we have to talk about people. The other thing is, is we've got to be clear, is that, and, and this, is, this is very important to all of us, when we talk about clergy, we have to realize that we also have to be looking for, uh, in, in, in our setting, uh, we have to be looking for persons who can effectively serve uh, uh, Hispanic populations for instance, in North Texas. Uh, we have to help congregations understand what it means uh, that their future will be brighter with a woman whom we want to send to them. Does that, does that make sense? So, so my role is, is not only to be looking for clergy, but to help the congregations realize what's happening and how they really can be best be served and being open to, uh, to people they would not have thought about being sort of uh, I get a report from a congregation, for example, we don't want a female pastor. And my immediate response is, get that PPR committee together. I'm coming to see them, you know. And I probably am going to. And the, real, the reason is it's a marker to say, okay, let's talk about what ministry is. So I, I think there's a, there's a piece with congregations. There's a piece with the Board of Ordained Ministry. And then this ongoing uh, um, formation of persons in terms of their ministry of which I'm fortunate that we have a center that does, I think is, is doing that well, or a couple of centers that are doing that well uh, in North Texas. So I realize that I'm going to have to start articulating and saying the same thing over and over and over and over again so that by the time that I retire in eight years, the people in North Texas will be able to literally finish my sentences. Not because I'm the wisest person in the room, but because, because of our work together, we will have crafted a vision and a focus of our life together and what it means to be in mission to the people of the North Texas uh, area, and not just Methodists, but to other people. Okay. Um, there was someone else at the back there. Yes, and then I'll come over here. Oh, okay, sorry. I'll go to you after... And probably for Don, on our Monday night uh, meeting of uh, board chairs, we were, were asking the question in our um, ordained ministry team meetings, are there certain items that district superintendents should not or could not vote on? In Missouri, we now, in addition to our uh, cabinet rep, have two district superintendents as regular members of the board. So I'm curious if there are certain things that by discipline or by judicial counsel, I'm going to look up 917, the cabinet should not vote on. If you could explain that. In our annual conference, the board reps, or the cabinet reps, rather, do not vote on anything. They, they do not participate in any kind of interviews. We allow them to come to the board of, uh, interview process and hang out, if you will, uh, in the area where the candidates are preparing for their time before the interview teams. But they do not participate in it at all, period. Uh, Bill will, um, laughs at me sometime about an incident a couple of years ago when uh, one of our superintendents actually got into one of the interviews. And uh, I found out about it at the close of the day. 
And uh, I went off, literally. Uh, and he's not been back. <laughs> Good for you. And the word has gotten out. Uh, we, we want your input. We, we want it to know what you know about the candidate so that we can make a good choice. But you don't have any business in that interview room. You don't have any business trying to influence that team. They've been trained. They know what they're doing. Uh, we spend hours in a separate session preparing our teams to do the interviews. But we don't need you in there, and we don't want you in there, and we don't expect to see you in there. Does that help? From your mouth to my ears. <laughs> Could, this is just a question for any of you. Could you speak about the issue of clergy transfers from one conference to another and the responsibility of the board to be in consultation with the bishop on those transfers? Okay, who wants to take this one? Um, well, uh, in, in our conference, uh, and this was one of the topics at our annual meeting of the executive committee, and the cabinet, we developed a process that pivots around our staff member, me, uh, as staff member to the Board of Ordained Ministry. I receive those requests. They come in sometimes from uh, a pastor, most often through uh, the district superintendent. And I'm the gathering point for all the material that is gathered to prepare the decision of the board regarding the status that that person will receive when we receive them. Uh, our cabinet rep on the board is the conduit in the conversation of the cabinet's readiness to appoint that person. Sometimes the cabinet has a place in mind and are more or less pushing the board to move rapidly so all things are in place. Other times, my position is, is kind of a stall place because we know there is not going to be an appointment available, and so I'm communicating to the person that wants to transfer that it's, it's a timely process. There are some things that you can do that are helpful to us now, but don't do these other things because they would be costly to you and there's no purpose in you investing your own personal resources in those type of uh, gathering of materials. The, the more important function that I have is, is I have the time to do background research on the individual. I have both the references that they've provided, but I can also take the time to find out where they've served and what the history of their service is, both within our denomination and other denominations. And it's a time-consuming task. Sometimes you have to uh, search out uh, individuals who were um, uh, supervisors in another denomination, uh, individuals that were uh, in the church where this person formerly was appointed, uh, a typical case or a good illustration, uh, I, I had just vibrant uh, references from one pastor who wanted to come and serve within our conference and ended up every reference was a lay person that left with this pastor when he moved on to a new appointment and then eventually out of the denomination to start an independent church. I was able to find out who the pastor's successors were and talk to each of them and got a better picture. So I can assemble that information uh, for the cabinet and for the board. It's often only needed for the cabinet. Once the district superintendents have a fuller picture of the person they're working with, um, they, they then accelerate or, or slow down the process out of their desire to appoint. I'm also, I, I, I stay very conscious of the whole pattern we have in transfer that you cannot 
exit through one door and go around the building and dump all your bad stuff and come in another door. So to just interpret to everyone and remind them repeatedly of the process, they have to come back through the door they, they exited and then begin to talk about transfer uh, or uh, uh, an appointment that, that's, um, uh, what's the word for it? Uh, an appointment from another conference into our conference for a period of time. Uh, one more question, um, and then our time is up, so Correct. thank you. So, Anita, can I say just one more word oh. about what Jeff's saying? Yes. We're, we're reinstigating a process in North Alabama that I think we used well a few years ago, and that is we've got what we call a transfer committee. It consists of a couple of members of the board and two members of cabinet. And we hope that when we get that fully operational, that no one will be able to come through the process without going first through the transfer committee. I'll do, still do the gathering like Jeff's talking about of the information, but then we've got cabinet and board cooperating to look at the issues and make a, help make a decision before it ever gets too far down the line. Henry and uh, the new chair at Wisconsin, I'm wondering if I'm making, it's a quick question, if I'm making a proper connection or conclusion. If the district superintendents are working for the board, and if they're not in the board level uh, or conference level, not part of deliberations about discontinuing, I've been part of a couple uh, district decisions about continuing a local pastor or not, and the district superintendent has been part of those conversations. Should they be stepping out of the room for that as well? Continuation of a local pastor Realizes. is a district committee function. Right. And DS is a part of the district committee as the executive is, our, is the way okay. we function. Okay, okay, that's what I wanted to check. As a follow-up to that, one of the things, and I, I, I understand in terms of, uh, you know, having people for all of the churches that every once in a while, um, what, I've, what I've discovered um, is that sometimes we, turn, we, we accept someone to do a local pastor role or supply role that we probably should not have because we don't have anybody. Mm -hmm. And, and that seems to create trouble. And so I think one of the things, that, probably a healthy conversation with, with the cabinet on the part of the board and everybody involved is let's don't get into any trouble here. And so let's, let's be clear we're just not filling somebody. Because everyone wants to say, let's, let's stop about that. And uh, um, so I think it'd be helpful to have a conversation about that, a significant conversation. Okay. Right. The other thing is, is sometimes I think we, we've used, the, uh, I think we ought to embrace the local pastor is, is a bona fide uh, way in which we have pastors in churches. And uh, oftentimes, what we, what if, when we discontinued someone, then the question would be, well, could they be a local pastor? <laughs> that seems to create some questions for me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, um, our time is gone, and I do want to thank each of you very much for your contribution and what you have shared with us this morning. So thank you.